All right. So good evening, everyone. Um, so yeah, I this last part of the course is a bit um, disorganized because we decided to drop Metroids and we decided to do something else, which uh, which ties more closely with what we have been doing so far. Um, yeah. So I'm calling this module six, and applications of duality and min max theorems. Right. So even the previous module was applications of duality, but we are just continuing in that direction. We're going to look at uh, other kinds of applications. Okay, so last time we discussed about uh, integrality of polyhedra and these totally unimodular matrices that guarantee that the polyhedron is integral. Uh, along with certain other conditions, uh, certain um, vectors have to be integral as well. But the main thing is really the matrix, uh, which is totally unimodular. Right. Okay. So I want to change to a new page today. We will uh, apply these results at some point, uh, perhaps today. So let me switch to a new page. And let's start talking about a topic that many of you uh, would have already heard about or would have already seen in previous courses. And that is max flow min cut, right? So let's see. So let's just call it max flow for now, okay? All right, so let me first just give you an instance of a max flow problem and a formal definition. And uh, at this point, I don't think we need to motivate things a lot, uh, but I'll give you two, one or two examples anyways, uh, just verbally. Right. So consider the following directed graph. All right, so I've got so you could have arcs in uh, both directions, or you could have just one of them between any two pair of vertices, any pair of vertices. Yeah, I'm not particularly consistent with where I put the arrow. Sometimes I put it, put it at the end, sometimes in the center, doesn't matter. And let's call this S and T. Um, and V1, V2, V3, and V4. And let's put capacities on these arcs. Okay, so the capacities are going to be non zero real, I mean, non negative real numbers. So All right, so what we want to do is we want to send flow from S to T that respects these capacities, right? So we'll define that formally, but one way to think of it is, let's say you have some sort of a water pipe network, right? And each pipe has a certain capacity, otherwise the pipe bursts, right? So you need to respect the capacity constraints. And on top of that, so we are sending water from S to T, right? So at any other point in the network or in the graph that we have, the directed graph, we want that whatever water is incoming is equal to the what amount of water that is outgoing. Right? That's essentially what the max flow problem is. We want to maximize the amount of water we can send because that is a very natural thing to do. Right? So you can think of it as a continuous problem like water flow or uh, data sent across a channel. Okay, or you can think of it as a more discrete problem where you are sending something like trucks on a road network. Right? So any of those problems can be thought of as a max flow problem. Of course, in the discrete setting, you want an integral number of trucks to be sent. Um, okay. So we are interested in integrality already, especially if our underlying application is a discrete application. All right. So let's uh, put things a bit more formally. So we have a directed graph H. And uh, I will just use V comma E, where E is going to be the set of arcs, because A is generally reserved for some matrix, right? So let's not confuse things, okay? So instead of being a set of edges, it's going to be a set of arcs, which basically means this is our direction. 
yeah sorry oh it will go away it will go away yeah yeah in fact if we tell them it will take longer so should disappear soon okay and in particular for an arc uv u is the tail and v is the head okay and we have two distinguished uh, vertices um, s and t and we have capacities going from the edges to non negative rails all right okay and uh, so basically h s t comma c this is going to be our max flow instance all right and we want to find a flow from s to t i'll call it an s t flow or just a flow um right so it's going to be a vector for each arc we want to figure out what is the amount of flow we are sending on that arc and it has to satisfy the capacity constraints and it has to satisfy the conservation constraints at every intermediate vertex which means not s not t we want the incoming flow to be exactly equal to the outgoing flow all right so um all right so an st flow or simply a flow is a function um right x from the edge set to the non negative reals that satisfies the following constraints all right so the first one let's write down the easy one first capacity constraints so for each arc we want the value given to that arc to be between 0 and the capacity of that arc all right and now let's write down the conservation constraints so let's draw a figure to understand what's going on let's say this is a vertex v which is not s or t right so what we want is we want the sum of these x values to be equal to the sum of these x values so we're going to need a notation to distinguish between the two types of arcs so for a vertex v um partial plus v is going to be all those arcs which have v um as a tail um set of arcs with v as the tail okay so these are the outgoing arc so this is the partial plus of v all right and partial minus v is going to be the set of arcs with v as head okay that's going to be partial minus of v all right and what we want is that the sum of all the arcs that are outgoing from v the x values this sum is exactly equal to the sum of the other one so i'll just uh, rearrange it and write it as this okay
All right. And this is of course for all vertices except for S and T. Yeah. All right. Any questions or concerns at this point? Is the problem clear? All right. And what we want to do is we want to maximize the amount of flow that is sent out from S and into T. And these two will be equal. Actually, that is implied by the constraints. I might, uh, you can try that on your own. Uh, so let's just focus on S. Right? So the goal is to find a flow uh, with maximum value, and I'll define value as what we discussed, and the value of a flow x is the flow going out of s. Right. So, Right. So typically you can think of there is actually a trick to do this. You can think that S has only outgoing arcs. I mean, really incoming arcs at S can be gotten rid of by a simple transformation. Right. So in some sense, it is really you can think of S as having only outgoing arcs. Right. But we won't put that in the assumptions. Whatever we are going to do is also going to apply to this more general setting in general. Okay. Yeah. There is a simple transformation which gets rid of them, but for now, let me not state that as an assumption. Okay. Um, okay. So one of the things that you notice is that this is a lot of things to write. This expression, right? Every time writing this expression takes a while. So let's just give it a simpler notation. Okay. So uh, we are going to write the flow at any vertex is basically this quantity. So for that vertex, you take uh, all the outgoing ones and subtract on the ingoing ones. Okay, so this is just a definition to simplify matters so that we don't always have to write this long expression. Everybody happy? Yeah. So in other words, this constraint is simply saying the conservation constraint can simply be written as fxv equals zero for all the vertices except s and t. Okay. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to maximize fxs, the flow going out of s, the flow at s. Okay. All right. So in fact, observe that this, along with these constraints, it's nothing but a linear program. Everything is linear, right? Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So let's move to. Uh, Let's just write down the LP here and copy paste it on the next page. So we are trying to maximize FXS subject to uh, FXV equals zero for all the vertices and the capacity constraints. And so this is really a, a vector comparison, which is saying that each component has to be between zero and the corresponding capacity, right? But you can just shorthand it. All right. Okay, great. So how do we write this in um, matrix vector notation? 
Let's just copy it and go to a fresh page. So the second constraint is very clear. It's already in a vector notation. So this one is just as it is, right? Let's focus on this one. Any suggestions? How should we go about this? Right. We have to be careful that we set this flow that right. Uh, into x should be one. It should uh, be zero. Should be right. Yes. Yeah. So basically, you are right. So essentially, we'll get something like a x equals zero, and we need to figure out what exactly a is. Yeah. So. All right, notice that we have all the vertices except SNT. So we also have to be careful that we are not including SNT in this. Right? But that's not difficult. We will start with what you suggested, the vertex arc incidence matrix. Right? There are going to be two extra rows, so we'll have to remove those rows. So A is the vertex arc incidence matrix, and we should make it clear what we mean by this matrix. right? When do we put a plus one, minus one, zero? Um, of the directed graph H minus the rows, minus two rows for S and T. Right? All right. And uh, so what are we doing? For any vertex V, um, we are taking the outgoing ones. That is going to be our plus, and the incoming ones are what we are subtracting. Right? So, in particular, if you look at an arc, where should I put a plus one and where should I put a minus one? Right. right. Yeah. Okay, so for any arc UV, you going to V, we will. Um, for the corresponding arc E, we will put a plus one in the tail of that arc and a minus one in the head of that arc and a zero everywhere else. Yeah. So, yeah. So, to make it very clear, A U comma E, the entry U comma E is either going to be a zero or a plus one or a minus one and the case where it is zero is when E is not incident at U, right? And the case where it is a plus one is when U is this guy and E looks like this. And the case where it is a minus one is when E is this guy and U looks like this. Uh, so maybe I should not say A, right? This is not, I'll just call this the uh, vertex arc incidence matrix of H, okay? And then we are removing two rows. That is what is our A matrix in this particular case. Good. And what about the objective function? It is defined similarly, right? Except that instead of looking at, so we are just going to look at the vertex S and we are going to put a plus one for all the arcs that are going out and a minus one for all the arcs coming in. Right? So we are going to maximize D transpose X 
where d transpose is this vector at the source right and whatever arcs are not incident s we'll just put a zero in those places yeah. all right great okay so that is our lp in the matrix vector format good and notice that this looks very much like an lp we wrote last time yep yeah, let's just quickly go there and see what happened so let me just change what i'm sharing all right Look at this second one here. Yeah, it's the same thing. So probably we can get that this is going to be an integral polyhedron under certain assumptions. So if we can show that our matrix A is a totally unimodular matrix, and if we assume that the capacities are integral, then we should get by this result that the feasible region is going to be an integral polyhedron, which in particular implies that there will always be an optimal solution that is an integral solution. Yeah. Okay. So that is exactly what we want to do next. Um, so let's go back to our current page. All right. <coughs> All right. So. Note that if we show that A is a TU matrix and we assume capacity is to be integral. which is only a fair assumption if you want integrality. Then by theorem 5.10 that we discussed last time, part two, um, the LP, the feasible region of P, will be integral polyhedron and this would imply um, this would imply that there exists a max flow that is integral right every extreme point is going to be integral so you will find an optimal solution, which will be your max flow that will be integral. All right. So let me just state this theorem and then let's worry about showing that A is a TU matrix. Okay. So we will show that it is a TU matrix. Assuming that we have shown that, let me just state the theorem so that we don't have to uh, come back the whole way. So All right, so let's say we are given HSTC, which is a max flow instance. So we are assuming that the capacities, that is a C vector, are integral, capacities are integers. Then, in particular, the feasible region. is integral and therefore there exists an optimal solution max flow that is integral okay i'll just say hence proved the only thing to show is that the matrix a is to you right modulo 
A6A is T. Okay. Any questions or concerns at this point? All right. So we will show that we will actually prove something more general. We will prove that a whole lot of matrices are TU. And this matrix will have the property, so we'll be done. Okay, so we'll show that a more general class of matrices, they are all TU. Okay. Anyone in the call has any questions or concerns? Anything not clear? All right, if not, <clears throat> so here is what we'll do. How did we obtain this matrix A? We took the vertex arc incidence matrix of the directed graph that we have, and we removed two rows from it. Okay, that's a minor detail. I mean, it is still a detail. We'll have to worry about that. But notice that the vertex arc incidence matrix of a directed graph already has a certain property, right? If you look at any column, can anyone tell me what does any column look like? If you look at any column, right? So a column will correspond to an arc. If you look at a column, what will it look like? Mostly zeros. Mostly zeros, one plus one and one minus one. Great. Okay. So in other words, it will be all zeros except for two entries, one of which will be plus one, one of which will be minus one. Great. And when we remove two rows, and it will still be true except that the plus one or minus one might disappear right in one of the places so a column could have just a plus one or just a minus one or just zeros technically right i mean okay so what we'll show is that all zero plus one minus one matrices where every column has at most one plus one and at most one minus one is a TU matrix. Okay. So that is what we are going to show. Here I'm 6.27 from CCPS. And this class of matrices was actually proposed by, I don't know if Poincare actually proved it, but apparently he had proposed it in 1900. I'll have to read the literature to understand what exactly uh, in what context he had looked at them. Okay. So, okay. So let's say A is any 0 plus 1 minus 1 matrix. So all entries are 0 plus 1 minus 1, where each column has at most 1 plus one and at most one minus one okay then it turns out that these matrices are all totally unimodular okay so clearly proving this proves what we want to prove. Okay. All right. So how shall we prove this? <clears throat> Any suggestions? Right, so what is our goal? We will take such a matrix and our goal is to show that every K cross K square sub matrix has determinant 0 plus minus plus 1 minus 1. So let's just write down. Okay, so the proof is A is a matrix as given with the given properties. Uh, and the goal is to show that for each square Sub matrix M of A, the determinant of M is either 0 or a plus 1 or a minus 1. 
Okay, so this is the goal. How shall we go about it? Any suggestions? What proof technique should we try? Induction. Let's try induction. Okay, so that's a good one to try. Okay, so it turns out it works. So what are the smallest uh, squared matrices, sub matrices? They are single entries, and they are all zero plus one minus one. So we are happy. Okay, so let's so let's suppose M is a um, let's say M is a k cross k um, square sub matrix. When k is equal to one, we are done. Since a is uh, zero plus one minus one matrix. Okay. All right. So now, uh, one. Uh, sorry, k is at least two, and assume inductively. that the desired property holds for all smaller square sub matrices right? in other words for any smaller value of k i mean k minus 1 k minus 2 and so on we know that this is true now we want to show it for the given K cross K sub matrix that we are looking at. All right. Hmm. So, any thoughts on how we should go about this? So, how do we go about with our induction step? Right. So, this is our base case, and now we are focusing on the induction step. Yeah. Uh, can people in the call still hear me? Madhya, Ravi? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, there was some weird noise in my speaker, so I wasn't sure. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, all right. So what should we do now? Yeah. Ah, expanding the determinant. K cross K will be a determinant zero, one, or minus one before that. Sure. So then, really expanding along one row. Okay. Six. Good. So I'll take one point from there. We want to expand along a row or a column. What should we expand along in this case? Should you expand on a row or a column? Column, right? Because we have a property about the columns, which is that there is at most one plus one and at most one minus one. So rather than doing Laplace expansion, expansion, which is what you are referring to, along a row, we will do it along the column. Okay. Um, okay. So we are already looking at a k cross k matrix. So rather than adding something, I'm going to subtract something. Okay. I'm going to take out a column and go to smaller matrices. Okay. Yeah, but we can go in the reverse direction, right? I can take a k cross k matrix and I can remove a column and I can say, oh, now I'll get k minus 1, k minus 1 mat squares of matrices. It's the same thing, right? It's a, it's a matter of how you phrase it, right? And the reason I phrase it this way is because I come from a graph theory perspective where going forward is very complicated and it can make a lot of, you, one can make a lot of mistakes. It's generally preferred to go backwards. It will become more clear when you take a graph theory course why it's preferred to go backwards. 
but in here it doesn't matter because k k plus one k minus one they're all integers, so it's not a big deal over here. No, well, I I generally don't distinguish between weak and strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I generally don't distinguish. We will actually get k minus one times k minus one. So we will actually be using strong induction, but typically I don't distinguish between the two. Right? I mean, yeah. Okay. So anyways, stay with me. But essentially, I'm going to do what you are suggesting. I'm just going to change the style slightly. Okay. So we are looking at a k cross k matrix sub matrix, which is our matrix M, right? And let's look at a specific column. So first of all, let's deal with the easy case. Supposing there is a column which is all zeros, what can we say then? Determinant is zero. So let's get rid of that. Okay. So suppose M has a zero column. Then the determinant of M is zero, and we are done. Okay. So now assume that. Every column has at least one non-zero entry. Now, suppose each column has at least one non-zero entry, and we know that it is at most two by the assumption. There is going to be one plus one and one minus one if there are two non-zero entries. Okay. So let us suppose that we have a column which has exactly one non-zero entry. Let us suppose we have such a column. Okay, so I'm going to split it into two cases. Case one, there exists a column with exactly one non-zero entry. Okay, let's make a small drawing here. So this is the sub matrix M, and we are looking at a specific column. There's going to be one entry which is a plus or minus one, and the other entries are all zeros. Okay, let's call this column J. Okay, now I'll do the Laplace expansion along this column, and I never remember. So how do we do it? So the determinant of the matrix is. We are going to sum from the rows from i going from one to k, right? Because it's a k cross k matrix, and we are going to take minus one to the power i plus j, um, m i j. This is small m i j, and determinant of m i j. So what is this small m? This is literally the entry i j of m. And this guy here is the sub k k minus one times k minus one uh, sub matrix of M obtained by removing row i and column j. Yeah, everybody happy with this? All right. So this is. Called Laplace expansion. All right. Okay. So let's think about what each term is going to be. Well, this one is clearly going to be a plus one or minus one. The entry i j of this matrix M, which is a sub matrix of A, is going to be a zero plus one or minus one. Right. This is either zero or plus minus one. And we have a smaller matrix, so by the induction hypothesis, it satisfies the desired conclusion, which is that the determinant of the smaller matrix is a zero plus one or minus one. So here we are using the induction hypothesis. So by induction hypothesis, this is going to be zero plus one or minus one. And you are multiplying all these three. Clearly, the answer is going to be zero plus one or minus one, right? And that's it, right? Uh, 
Ah, right. Um, yeah. Um, only one entry, only one entry is a plus or minus one in this column. So all of them will basically be zero except for one entry, which will remain. Okay, fine, good. So finally, this is equal to zero plus or minus one. So maybe I should make it more clear. I should say this belongs to zero plus or minus one since only one entry in column J uh, is non-zero. All other uh, all other terms in the summation will evaluate to zero. Um, the M I J. Yeah. So wherever it is one or minus one, it will actually be just. No, but what if the determinant of the, what if the determinant of the M I J matrix? Uh, so it will be just M I J. I mean wherever I J is the non zero no, no, no. value. No, we are we are M I the determinant of M I J is the matrix after removing the row I and column J. Right. So the smaller matrix. Yeah, so that could be zero, right? By induction, that could be zero again. Yeah, right. So the entry could be non-zero, but the determinant after removing those two rows and columns, the one row and one column, could again be zero. So technically, you could again land in zero. Right. So it would not be correct to omit zero from here. Yeah. All right. Um. Good. Any questions or concerns at this point? All good. Okay. So that is case one when we have a column with exactly one non-zero entry. Okay, so let us suppose we don't have such a column. What does that mean? Every column has every column has a plus one and a minus one. Okay, so case two is uh, each column has two non-zero entries. Exactly two, and these will be a plus one and a minus one. What happens in this case? If all your columns have one plus one and one minus one, what can you say? Anyone in the call? What happens if every column of your matrix, of your squares, of the is zero. sorry? Some of the rows is zero. So you Did you say properties are uh, equal to zero? You are saying the determinant is zero. Is that right? Uh, zero. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't hear very clearly. So yeah, add up all the columns. What do you get? Add up all the columns. You get the zero column. Right, so the determinant is zero. Okay. So that means that sum of all columns is exactly the zero vector, and that implies the determinant of the matrix is zero. So that's it. So we have proved that all such matrices, which were described by Poincaré in 1900, they all have, they are all TU matrices. In particular, our matrix A from the max flow min cut LP has this property, right? Every column has at most one plus one and at most one minus one. All the other entries are zero. So we are done. We have shown that um, we have proved theorem 5.6. This is no longer a modular. Okay. So that's, I think, all I have for today. Uh, I just want to end the lecture today with a few questions that I want you to think about. And you might have already come across these um, in your prior uh, encounters with Max Flow. All right. So maybe I'll just take them here. In the remaining space.
Okay, so if I give you a flow in a certain network, right? Let's uh, let's see one quick flow to get an example. So, okay, so let me just uh, write down one flow here. Yeah, so let me write down a flow in some different color, maybe red. So we could, for example, send one over here, two here, one, 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 zero, one, and two. Observe that the flow going out at S is equal to three. The flow going out at T is uh, in at T is, uh, of course, three. Uh, as we expect, and at every other vertex, which is not S or T, the incoming flow is exactly equal to the outgoing flow, right? Which is what makes this a uh, valid flow. I think I, uh, yeah, we yeah, forgot to put one number. This is a one. Yeah. Okay. So this uh, this particular assignment satisfies both the capacity and conservation constraint. Sorry. V2 to V1. Um, uh, so which one are you calculating the conservation constraint for? For V2? Yeah, incoming is two v one because this arc is also incoming. Outgoing is also two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So hopefully it's fine. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, there's the uh, arcs in both directions. It's a bit confusing. Yeah. So anyway, so this is uh, this seems to be a valid flow, right? Um. So if I give you a certain flow. If you want to convince me that this is not a max flow, you can just show me a better flow, right? But what about the converse? How do you convince someone that a certain flow is actually a max flow? In other words, can you find upper bounds on the value of a flow? If you can find upper bounds, then maybe you can convince someone that a certain flow is a max flow, right? So here the value is equal to three. If you can show me that there is an upper bound of three, then okay then this has to be a max flow, right? So that is the question I want you to think about. How would you prove upper bounds on the value of a flow in any given instance of the max flow problem? Right, so. Can we find upper bounds for the maximum value of a flow? In other words, how do you convince someone that a given flow is a max flow right okay and uh, i also wanted to state a fun fact that i just noticed in my notes um so anyways these we'll discuss tomorrow uh the fun fact i want to mention is we have been talking a lot about tu matrices right so one might ask so this is one family of matrices that are tu matrices but turns out there are other matrices that are also tu matrices you will be proving one such thing on your assignment five. Um, okay, so there's an interesting question. Can you actually characterize the TU matrices? In other words, given a zero plus one minus one matrix, can you actually tell in polynomial time whether it is a totally unimodular matrix or not? Turns out the answer is yes. And this is a deep theorem in Metroid theory that I don't know much about. I'm hoping to learn about it. So I'll just state it as a fun fact. 
uh, Seymour in 1980 proved uh, a characterization of totally unimodular matrices. And his work implies that they are polytime recognizable. So given a given a matrix, you can tell in polynomial time whether it is a TU matrix or not. Uh, recognizable. And there is some connection with uh, matroids. Which I still don't fully understand. So I'm hopefully um, going to understand eventually. Don't know. All right. So that's all for today. Are there any questions or concerns? Okay. So if not, uh, feel free to leave the meeting. Anyone in the call has any questions or concerns? All right, so I'm going to stop recording now.